session from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth, in collaboration with my wonderful brother in Christ from the United States of America, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. We are gathered here together today for the 20th time to do an examination of how the New Testament proves the complete and perfect fulfillment of Jesus Christ of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 specifically. Last time we started reading the book of Acts, chapter 7, because after Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and going up into heaven, he gave the apostles the Holy Spirit to continue the 70th week of Daniel until the very last prophet ever sent was stoned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, was witness of that because he led that stoning. And we are talking about Acts chapter 7. We are in verse 37 and we are going to continue in a second to read that to the end to show you that this very last refusal of the hierarchy of the Jewish people in the time was the ending of the 70th week. After that, the gospel went to the Gentiles because finally the Jews, for the final time, rejected the kingdom of God explained to them by Jesus Christ in his ministry seven years on earth, three and a half years in the flesh and three and a half years in the spirit through the apostles. So I want to very warmly welcome Brother Tom Fress to the broadcast. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk, and hello to all the listeners. I'm very, very happy and pleased to be here. Little uh, laryngitis this uh, today, so I'll uh, I'll do the best I can. Good. I'll do the reading. You do the commenting. That will spare your voice a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. We're gonna do it like this. Now let's put the picture up here and then the PDF with the reading of Acts uh, chapter seven. As I told you, we came <clears throat> in the last broadcast number nineteen unto verse thirty-seven. Here, Stephen pleads before the Sadducees and the Pharisees in Samaria. This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with your fathers, 
who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as of this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned, and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your god Ramphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God, and desire to find a tabernacle for God, for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? So I just want to continue this reading now is that we can stop any time and go a little bit deeper into the verses. If there's any comment that you want to talk about, then please just uh, switch on your mic and interrupt me in the reading, okay? Yes, okay. Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost? As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. We have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and then gnashed on him with their teeth. Okay, I, I, I think there's worthy of a comment here, at least this this one. Sure. Remember, it's, it's Stephen who has copiously proven that he himself is a Jew of the house of Judah and that he is an impeccable historian. He has recited off the top of his head the whole history of the Hebrew people from Abraham on. And he, these Sanhedrin, these, these Sadducees and Pharisees, the whole ruling class of Israel, it has to be in awe of his recitation of Jewish history. And also the conviction that he's laying upon their hearts that you have always slain the prophets of Almighty God. And of course, the point that he's making is that you've slain not only the prophets, but now you've slain the Messiah, the very Son of the living God, the one who came, according to Daniel's prophecy, to become the sacrifice himself, to put an end of all sacrifices, to completely eliminate the sin issue, to put an end of sin, it says, to bring an end of sin in Daniel's prophecy, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to make reconciliation with God. That's what Jesus' purpose was. In other words, to restore the Hebrews to the status enjoyed by 
Ab- or rather by Adam before he sinned. And so it says, and it says, and when he when they heard these things from Stephen, they were cut to the heart. What does that mean? They comprehended precisely the message that Stephen was attempting to give them, that they had just slain their own Messiah, that they had carried on the acts of their fathers in killing the prophets, completely disobedient and worthy of God's judgment. And not only are they guilty of killing the prophets, but now they're guilty of killing the one who came to save them once and for all from sin. And it says they were cut to the heart. I mean, you don't, you're not cut to the heart unless you're completely convicted of your sin, right? The expression that they were cut to the heart indicates that what was required next was a complete and total uh, capitulation to Stephen. A heartfelt uh, uh, uh a heartfelt contrition and confession of their sin and acceptance of Christ as their Savior, that they had sinned not only against the prophets but against the very Son of God, the very Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And they comprehended the sin that they had just committed in killing Christ. It says they were cut to the heart. And had they been obedient to the Spirit of God that convicted them of their sin, so much so that they were cut to the heart, the passage should continue to read, and they dropped to their knees and their faces on the steps of the Sanhedrin. They rent their clothes. They were they they confessed their sin before Stephen and before the whole Jewish the house of it, uh, the house of Judah, and repented of their blood bath in Christ, and and professed him to be the Lamb of God. But it, but they didn't. They gnashed at Stephen with their teeth. In other words, they had a choice right then and there, being fully convicted of their sin, accepting in their hearts that they had slain their own Messiah. They rejected the Spirit leading them to repent in sackcloth and ashes right there on the spot at the witness of Stephen. Instead, they decided to kill the minister to kill the witness, to kill the last messenger of the truth to to, to the, the house of Judah, Stephen. It should not read, they gnashed on him with their teeth. It should read that as they were cut to the heart and totally in repentance, they embraced Stephen with a holy embrace but they didn't. They gnashed at him with their teeth. (laughs) Can you just imagine? They weren't repentant. They were convicted for sure, but they were not repentant. That somehow if they killed Stephen and shut him up, the guilt of their killing of their own Messiah would somehow go away. And isn't that descriptive of all of our lives. We kill the messenger of the truth. We persecute those who witness the truth to us from the scriptures and truly convict our hearts. And rather than ha- receiving it with contrition and, and, and repentance, we lash out at the bringer of bad tidings and seek to destroy them to seek to destroy their reputations, uh, seek to limit their access to to the the ear of the people, to cancel their programs, 
to uh, bring even false witness against them, false scandals in their life, to diminish their reputations. Uh, Peter wasn't, or rather Stephen wasn't so lucky in this case. They stoned him to death, okay, like a common murderer. The stoning that the Sanhedrin deserved for killing their own Messiah, they perpetrated upon Stephen, the message, the messenger of the truth. It was Stephen who re received the death sentence. And they sealed their stiff neckedness, their rebellion with the blood of Stephen, the messenger of God, just like they sealed their doom when they slew the prophets of old. It was a covenant in Stephen's blood to rebel against the Lamb of God and to, rem and to remain in their sin. And this demanded God's judgment that the prophecies were going to be fulfilled. They were going to be kicked out of their land, their temple, and their city was going to be destroyed by the Romans. And they would be vagabonds in the world, persecuted, shunned, calumniated, and killed, tortured, and still to this day. They suffer the consequences for stoning Stephen and rejecting Christ. What we're reading is the, is the literal account of the very last witness of the Messiah, the Prince, through the mouth of Stephen, the spirit-filled mouth of Stephen to the Jewish nation once and for all, the very last witness and testimony. Why? Because the 490th year is over at this point. The stopwatch has run out of time. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks plus one week. That's 70 weeks total or 490 liter literal years. And Stephen makes his final testimony to the, to the religious and political leaders of Jerusalem Daniel's people and Jerusalem for the last time. The 490th year ends with the stoning of Stephen. And then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. And as I said last time, I'll say it again. Because of the brilliance and astuteness of, of, of Yerk, we asked a question how do we know the 70th week of Daniel is over? It's this simple. We know the 70th week of Daniel is over because the gospel went to the Gentiles. It's been in the hands of the Gentiles ever since the stoning of Stephen, and it will be up to the Gentiles to preach the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in his blood covenant to the rest of the world until Christ returns. When the, de when the time of the Gentiles is over, when the time of the Gentiles be come in, the Scripture says, and uh, we have all this uh, false hope that the Jews are now are going to uh, pick up the gospel and uh, the Gentile world is going to be destroyed in a great tribulation. Seven years of great tribulation. As much of that that they can that they can forcibly make come to pass. They're going to get, they're going to do it because that's their intention. Uh, but they're false prophets, okay. And just because they have the power to physically fulfill these prophecies doesn't make them true prophecies. The 70th week of Daniel is over. They would have you believe the 70th week of Daniel is not over. Now, I who's think, telling you the truth? I, I think, Tom, that is a very important point that you make, that the Jews, after the 70th week of Daniel was over, were scattered all over the world. We know that came with the abomination of desolation, standing at the door in Jerusalem, 70 AD, when the Roman army came, 
destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and dispersed the Jews all over the world and they have been persecuted all over the world ever since and that persecution is still going on as you said. Now people may ask Tom, why are the Jews so heavily persecuted? Why does God allow the persecution of the Jews all these years? I think I have an answer for that. Well, go ahead. And the answer is because they repeatedly always rejected the Messiah. They rejected all the prophets in the Old Testament. They rejected Jesus Christ when he came and put him to the cross. They rejected Stephen in his last attempt to tell them that it is time to repent and to accept Jesus Christ. And that's why they are persecuted or allowed to be persecuted even by God all through the world today. Now, the last point that you made is the most important one now. The gospel went to the Gentiles with the ending of the 70th week of Daniel, as we understand. So ever since that time, the Gentiles also have time to accept Jesus Christ. But do they? No, because of the futurist teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Jesuit order in this world, people reject Jesus Christ. And the same judgment that has come on Judah in the time of 70 AD is coming over the Gentiles who reject Jesus Christ today. Mm -hmm. That is my understanding of that. Yeah. And it's even more ugly than that, in my estimation, Yerk. Because Paul told the churches what the objective of the church of Jesus Christ should be. And that is to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah. To provoke the Jews who were the slayers of their own Messiah to receive him. To finish the repentance that was owed to Stephen by the Sanhedrin when he gave them their last witness when they were cut to the heart to keep the message of Stephen fresh on our lips, to show the Jews compassionately the scriptures that shows that Messiah the Prince was Jesus. The 70th week of Daniel was Jesus. Their lamb, their prince, their king, their priest, and their all in all, their very salvation was Messiah the Prince, Jesus. And we were to show them the blessings that we receive from knowing and preaching this gospel. That, that was the whole mission of the church, not only to spread the gospel all over the world, but to bring the Jews in too. But what happened? The Roman Catholic Church began calling them Christ killers, okay? That's not how to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah. Here's a message that every Christian needs to realize. It was not the Jews nor the Romans that killed Jesus. It was our sin that killed Messiah. Because the sin of man is what Messiah came to die for so that we might all be redeemed. And to start calling the Jews Christ killers, or even the Romans Christ killers, is to miss the point. But the onus of Christ killer stuck to the Jews. And it became fashionable among Catholics, Roman Catholics in the Roman Catholic Church to persecute the Jews in order to elevate themselves and to hide the fact that it was Romans who crucified him. So they worked all the harder to shift the blame of killing Messiah onto the Jews to hide their own crime, to, to, to uh, so much as atone for the Roman part of the killing of Messiah, the crucifixion of the Christ. And Rome has literally been the battle axe against the Jews ever since. Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, said somehow 
convince the world that it was a Christian church, by, by, uh, God forbid, had provoked all the other so-called Christian churches to do likewise. Even Martin Luther was a persecutor of the, of, of the Jews. He did not heed the warning of Paul, who said, I would give up my own salvation for the salvation of my Jewish brethren. That's essentially what Paul was saying. It meant everything to Paul to see the Jews repent of their sin just as they were initially inclined to do on the steps of the Sanhedrin when, when they were cut to the heart and they ripped their clothes. But instead, they stoned Stephen to shut him up. They killed the messenger when they were, they had the very option of accepting their guilt and their shame and repenting and accepting their Messiah, Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church persecuted the, the, the Jews to the point where no Jew would ever trust a quote-unquote Christian, whether he be Roman Catholic or Protestant or any other denomination. And this is how Satan made sure that the Gentile Christians could not see to it that the Jews were grafted back into the vine. The Roman Catholic Church is the very father of anti-Semitism. I mean, even Constantine, if you'll recall the history, even Constantine, when he changed the solemnity of the Jewish Sabbath to the first day of the week, made it illegal to observe the biblical Sabbath for fear of being convicted, tried and convicted of Judaizing. He made it a criminal act to celebrate the Sabbath with the Jews. He called that Judaizing. And that's where it comes from, the Roman Catholic Church under Constantine. Constantine was the one who originally set the whole world against the Jewish nation by simply changing the solemnity of the Hebrew Sabbath, the law of God, to the first day of the week. Now we're off to the, to the anti-Semite anti races. We're off to the races in a, a whole Christian era, the entire Christian era of not provoking the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah, for their purpose of their own salvation, but to, to persecute them, kill them, chase them from land to land, make sure they never got any hope or help from anyone. Okay? That's, that's in, why it's you. In, in, fact, then, in fact, then, Tom, the Gentiles or the Roman Catholic Church is a continuation of the Sadducees in chapter 7 of exactly. the Book of Acts. Exactly. They're carrying on the battle that the Sanhedrin uh, started. Rather than accepting the message, kill the messenger. That's right. Yeah. And look, that's why they wear the beanie. The, the Pope wears this little beanie. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's admitted in the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, the 1913 Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, that that little beanie represents the priesthood of the ancient Jewish faith. Replacement that theology, they, right? They are the, that they are the, mod, the Gentile replacement of the Jewish priesthood. That's why they make sacrifice like the Jewish priesthood did. Now, let me tell you something that you should already know if you've been careful to listen to what we've been saying for the last few months. The way to positively, unmistakably, inerrantly identify the, the synagogue of Satan, the very church of Antichrist, is if they make sacrifice. Because Daniel said, Messiah would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Isn't that what it says? It, it absolutely does. That was the reason Jesus came, to fulfill the law of God perfectly and completely and then offer himself a sacrifice to end all sacrifices. 
to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to make reconciliation for sin, put an end of all sacrifices for all men for all time. Okay? To bring in an everlasting righteousness. That's what he did on the cross. Now, who would, who would dare continue to make animal sacrifices? After Christ literally came to put an end to all sacrifices, it's rebellion. It is absolute, abject, in-your-face rebellion. It is in complete and total rejection of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is an abject, positive, identifiable, visible rejection of Christ, no less than the stoning of Stephen by the Sanhedrin. And because they did not reject, uh, they did not accept their lamb sent from the Father in heaven, they had no other option but to continue animal sacrifices, continue the Temple Mount worship, continue the sacrificial system on top of Temple Mount. They had to sew the veil of the temple back together, and they had to makeshift, complete, uh, c continue with what they did always before. And now you know why the Jesus said there be not one stone left upon another. He simply was sell telling the Jews, I am your lamb, take it or leave it. There is no other means of salvation for the Jew or the Gentile. In Christ we become one in Christ. There is no more Jew or Gentile. We are one family in Christ. But the Jews sewed the veil of the temple back up, decided to continue animal sacrifices, and they naturally would if they didn't receive Christ as their sacrifice. So the sacrifices and oblations were not put to an end, and they began to do animal sacrifices and oblations. Common sense demands that, that that's what they did. And that's precisely why Jesus sent the Roman 10th Legion, just like he sent the Babylonians before them 500 years ago, just like he sent the Assyrians uh, a 1,000 years ago to take Israel captive, to take Judah captive. He sent the Romans to destroy the place, to destroy the Jews that didn't flee, which is every Jew and they destroyed the city. They burned it to the ground. They took the stones, one stone down upon another to, receive, to retrieve the gold that had melted. And, uh, and prophecy was completely and perfectly fulfilled. Everything in Daniel's prophecy was perfectly and completely fulfilled. Everything concerning the Jews in Jerusalem and Messiah the Prince was fulfilled by the 490th year at the stoning of Stephen, and yet some, what, 30-some-odd years after the complete destruction of the temple. And the message to the whole world in that act is, no more sacrifices, no more oblations. Jesus is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Take him or leave him. Take him and be forgiven Leave him and die in your sins. That is how the Jew is saved, just like the Gentile is saved. You believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't, and you die in your sins. So what's the talk about building a temple in Jerusalem? What's the talk about finding the Ark of the Covenant and the ashes of the red heifer and the priesthood and all the idea of animal sacrifices again? can be for no other purpose than to cause the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves. And wouldn't Rome just love it if the Jews, unable to kill them in World War I, World War II, and all the anti-Semitic actions of the Roman Catholic Church and Roman Catholics for the last 2,000 years, what if they finally succeeded in destroying every Jew in this world by causing them to eat and drink damnation to themselves, just like they do in the Roman Catholic Church with the Mass. Death loves company. Death is the Roman Catholic Church. 
and if they can cause the Jews to make sacrifice, they've succeeded in killing the Jews. It's the final answer to the final Jewish question. And now you know why all the kings of the earth assisted the Vatican in creating the modern nation state of Israel. It's not for their salvation. It's for their ultimate damnation. And only people like you and me, Yerk and me and the listeners, can stand in the way of that eventuality. We must tell the Jews the truth. They have no other way of salvation than the blood, the efficacious atoning blood of their Messiah 2,000 years ago in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Take him or die in your sins. There is no dispensational difference between Jew and Gentile. There's not one means of salvation for the Gentile in the, in the, in the atoning blood of Christ and then another means of salvation or more correctly, a different means of salvation for the Jews. You see, all of your future as pastor would have you believe that there's a dispensational difference between Gentile salvation and Jewish salvation. That's why we don't try to convert the Jew to Jesus. You see, their only hope, we don't try to convert them. We're instructed by the papacy not to convert the Jew to Christianity. Not to provoke them to jealousy. That's right. Do not provoke the Jew to jealousy for Jesus, their Messiah. We have another means of salvation for them. And what is that? Animal sacrifice. A third so temple. Eat and, and, and every Christian in the sound of my voice prays for the existence of the Jewish nation, prays for the Jews to make Aliyah to Israel, prays for the Jews to build a temple, prays for the Jews to get their temple furniture and the Ark of the Covenant and the whole kit and caboodle, praise for the priesthood, praise for the lambs, the goats, the pigeons, and the doves to be sacrificed, and praise for the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves. That's the whole direction that futurism has put upon God's holy people that ought to know better. We've got no excuse. None. We've caused the death of our Hebrew brethren. If they build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again, their blood should be on our heads. Our God is a righteous God. And he sees everything that goes on in the dark. Any Jew that dies because of a futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy and begins to eat and drink damnation in a phony futurist 70th week of Daniel. His blood be on our head. What a horrifying reality. We should have had the spiritual drive from beginning to end to provoke the Jews to jealousy, just like Paul instructed us. But we followed Constantine's precedent. We followed the Roman Catholic Church's precedent. And let me tell you, the biggest Zionist in all the world is the papacy. It is the papacy that hopes to replace Christ in the, in the kingdom of Christ. The false Messiah, the papacy, intends to replace Christ. And it's going to be that way if the phony futurist 70th week of Daniel gets fulfilled the way Rome has it envisioned with our help. And we are helping him with both hands and both feet. 
So who should the blame reside with? These aren't just false accusations. I'm justified in everything that I say. Are we going to live with the guilt of, of, of the spiritual murder of every Jew in this world? We have to tell the Jews, sacrifice and oblation would I not receive from the Jews. But the sacrifice of his own son, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Deny him one more time by eating and drinking the, 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 the flesh and the meal offerings of the sacrifice, and you have eaten and drunk damnation to yourself, no less than you did when you stoned Stephen. The direction of all of Christianity is aimed at seeing the Jews eat and drink damnation to themselves. And not only that, but because we believed in this futurist lie, we've forgotten who the Antichrist is and what we find him doing, selling his ecumenical poison all over the Protestant and Gentile worlds to unite us in a common communion, which is a uniform sacrifice of the mass by every Christian, by every denomination. The whole body of Christ is in the same peril as we have put the Jews in to make sacrifice and to eat and drink damnation to ourselves. That's what the man of sin in Rome has planned. Now, do you still want to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church? Do you still want to deny that the papacy is not the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy when the Antichrist of Rome has succeeded in selling a lethal poison to the Jews just like a lethal poison to the Gentiles? A sacrifice! When Jesus caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't get more deceived than the entire Christian world right now in your face is deceived. They are on the very precipice of eating and drinking damnation to themselves and causing the Jews to do likewise. And you'll not hear this message from any church in this country or around the world. That is just how complete the deception is. Well, you say, well, Tom, Satan just isn't that crafty. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. And the evidence speaks for itself. It's visible. It's undeniable. It's inarguable. There is but the smallest remnants of Christianity that know these truths. And of them, only a minuscule percentage are willing to speak about it openly. And if you're hearing this truth, if you're comprehending this truth, you can accept no other explanation but that the Holy Spirit of God is intends to spare you from the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And he has shown mercy to you in seeing that these truths are preached with your hearing, within your hearing. You've been called out of the deception. Will you meet the call? Back to you, Yerk. I'd like to make another point, Tom, that you scratched through your explanation that you just gave. Speaking of the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, which came, in my understanding, exactly 40 years after Jesus was crucified. 
We see in this little picture that Jesus was crucified in 31 AD. He was baptized in 27 AD, so that's four years in between. But that's because we speak of three and a half years. Yeah, Three and a half years of Jesus' um, ministry in the flesh, and three and a half years of Jesus' ministry in the spirit. So three and a half years, when you put in AD 27, he was anointed. We know that it was about his 30th birthday. And because it is three and a half years before his crucifixion, and his crucifixion took place in what we call today months of April, about the time, as we can quote-unquote believe our Roman calendar we are following, three and a half years before that he must have been anointed. So that puts his anointing somewhere in the month September or October the year before. So when you have the AD 31, that can be the very beginning of AD 31, and you can have at the very end, for example, at AD 70, have the destruction of the temple, or you can have it at the same time. It is 40 years in between, and that is the point that I want to make. 40 is a very, or like 4, 40 or 400, 4 is a very important biblical, uh, biblical number. Jesus <clears throat> went after his baptism 40 days in the desert, tempted by the devil. The Jews were captive 400 years in Israel. They wandered 40 years through the desert before they came into the Holy Land. And there was given 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion until the destruction of the temple. I think those two belong together, those two points. Because Jesus on the cross said, It is finished. The sacrifices are finished. And the final sign that the fact sacrifices are finished in the first place was, as you said, the the veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. That's God's work at the moment when Jesus gave up the ghost. But the second point, that there are no more sacrifices even possible in the temple, was the destruction of the temple by the Roman army in 70 AD, 40 years exactly after the time that Jesus gave up the ghost on the cross. That at least is my understanding. I don't know what you make of that, Tom. No, I understand your your point. You've made it uh, repeatedly to me, and I understand it. I, I've never argued with it. So there was a time of there was a time of uh, of testing for Jews, and that Jews is that is the, spoken of, that is spoken okay, of in the Olivet discourse in Matthew twenty four, and that mm -hmm. is maybe something that we will we will approach much later in the same study also. Jesus told the Jews when the, uh, uh, when the uh, abomination stands before the holy place, that is the Roman army stands, they get out of Dodge. And they were given two, uh, two chances because it was the Jewish-Roman war that took place between 66 and 70 AD. First, the Roman army came, besieged Jerusalem, but for no apparent reason they went away. That was the abomination that, uh, that makes desolate standing before the holy place. And the Jews who understood the Olivet Discourse, who understood Matthew 24, the warnings Jesus gave them, understood now is the time to flee the city. And all who understand were saved, or all who understood were saved, went to the mountains, were saved, and none of them perished. Only the ones who rejected Jesus Christ more than one million, according to Flavius Josephus in his uh, historical uh, work on the uh, on the war of the Jews with the Romans, uh, on, on the Jewish history there, uh, were killed exactly 40 years after Jesus was crucified. Because this way, the Bible actually uh, makes sense. You have to put these numbers in there too and understand that 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, when the veil of the temple was rent, that was the first sign, then the whole temple was taken down by the force of the Romans and no more sacrifice was possible. And they have had 40 years in between to still come to their senses, to still understand what Stephen told them in 34 AD with the ending of the 70th week, to still understand the gospel and to still understand the prophets of the Old Testament, especially Isaiah, when we speak of about, for example, Isaiah 53, or we speak of Nehemiah, of Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, all 
prophets that spoke about the coming of Jesus Christ. They were given this last 40 years until the total and complete destruction and then afterward the dispersion of the Jewish people all over the world with continual uh, persecution up to this day today, up to the day when Jesus Christ will come back. Not only the Jews will be persecuted, but also every real Israelite and a real Israelite is an Israelite by faith. And those are the ones that are being persecuted by Satan from the beginning since the Garden of Eden. Okay, just to make sure everyone understands, there's no controversy here between me and Yerk, because my reference was the stoning of Stephen to 70 AD, which would be about 36 years. Yerk is making reference to the, to the cross onto the the uh, de uh, the uh, destruction of the temple, which is 40 years. So let everybody understand. My reference was from the end of the 70th week at the stoning of Stephen in 34 AD until the, to the, the uh, temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD was approximately 36 years. But uh, from, from Christ's crucifixion in 31 AD to the destruction of the temple was 40. So... There's no controversy. No, there's no controversy, okay. but I think that that is a very interesting point to, to have a look on on this and uh, even to do maybe a deeper study in this, because that makes logic that you again have this 40 years in between, like the 40 well, years you, of the wandering you, in the desert. You've opened the door for me to make the pitch that, that we talked about even before the program. Mm -hmm. Look, I want all the listeners to know that is seemingly extensive as this research, this this. Uh, this going through the scriptures uh, to prove this, the 70th week of Daniel is over, uh, which we have thoroughly done. I don't think anybody could argue otherwise. But what I, the point I want to make is it's, we're just scratching the surface. You do your own study of the New Testament. Find every reference in the scripture that fulfills Daniel's prophecy. And you'll see with your own eyes that this study that we've just nearly concluded is only a superficial treatise on the subject. The New Testament is literally dripping with the very language of Daniel's prophecy. And uh, we may have done a pretty good job, but all we did was give you enough to pique your interest, to pique your motivation, to do your own examination holding Daniel's prophecy on a three by five card right there by your computer monitor, right there by your Bible, and then start in with the New Testament, reading the New Testament, and ticking off one after another, after another, after another, the fulfillments as recorded in the New Testament that prove beyond any question that the 70th week of Daniel is perfectly and completely fulfilled. And if you comprehend that, and if you've seen it with your own eyes, then you cannot continue with your phony futurist interpretation. You have to realize the 70th week of Daniel is over, and something else you'll have to realize is, if it's over, any refulfillment of it is man-made not God made. God is not the author of confusion. And man has created a future fulfillment because they don't like the original fulfillment because it makes Jesus the Christ. And it makes the Pope the Antichrist most and for all. And it makes the Pope the Antichrist. And a future fulfillment will deny that Jesus is the Christ, but that the Pope is the Antichrist. Rome intends for the future 70th week of Daniel to declare himself. Use it as a tool, an instrument to convince the whole world that the Pope is the Christ. The few Jews that were expecting God to lead them back to Jerusalem were the ones that were persecuted in the Holocaust all throughout the 20th century because they were in the way 
of founding that nation state of Israel that you have there now, because they said, we want the hand of God lead us back into our homeland as he did when he got us out of Egypt. And right. he didn't. It was man who founded that state of Israel. It was the English nation together with the French nation who, at the fall of the Ottoman Empire, by making sure of the Balfour Declaration, secured that land, took the bankers of the Vatican, the Rothschilds, to buy country and to set Jewish settlers there to put a definite state of Israel in there and then to claim this is biblically proven. And they twist all the scripture of the Old Testament when everything there is pointing just to the end of the Jewish nation as we speak about this with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the stoning of Stephen and they put that in the future and they speak of a future Israel that is not there the nation state and that is the sell, point they had to sell dispensationalism to warrant the modern nation state of Israel dispensationalism says that the Jews have to return to their land and begin animal sacrifices again. There's a different form of salvation for the Jew than there is for the Gentile. That's what dispensationalism is all about. And how convenient it fits right along with Rome's future. Do you realize how absolutely necessary it is for the Pope? If he's going to ride into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, and refulfill the prophecies of Jesus, convincingly, there's got to have a modern nation state of Israel. There's got to be Jews living in the land. And if the phony Antichrist, the futurist Antichrist, who we don't know who that's going to be yet, that might be Mickey Mouse for all that matter, but if he's going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease, well then there's got to be animal sacrifices and oblations taking place, right? Well, that means there has to be a temple right? And that means there has to be Jews living in the land, right? It's all man-made, folks. Your futurist thing that you think is God's fulfilling of Bible prophecy is a lie. It's man-made. It's made by the man of sin in Rome. It's a phony refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, which Jesus, the true Messiah, fulfilled 2,000 years ago. And the only logical explanation you can think of that the Rome would go to all this trouble with the help of all the kings of the earth to create this, this modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the Rhine is to present to the world a false Messiah. And I can tell you who it is. It's the papacy. Nothing else makes sense, okay? The papacy has always claimed to be the vicar of Christ on earth, the replacement of the Son of God. And he demands under Roman Catholic canon law that every king, queen, prince, and potentate of this world kiss his ring and obey his commandments. And he also insists that every man, woman, and child on the planet worship and obey him. It's codified in Roman Catholic canon law for a millennia. It's no guesswork to figure out who it is that wants to fulfill a phony refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. To deny that Jesus was the Christ and to put the Pope in his place. And that is the papacy. It, this is not rocket science. This is not hard to believe. And history and prophecy make it plainly evident. So what do you do with your futurist leanings? Abandon them like the plague. Because it is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And its purpose is to cause you to eat and drink damnation to yourself. The Roman Catholic Mass. That's what the ecumenical movement is about. That's what the Council of Trent is about. That's what the First Vatican Council in 1870 was about when the papacy was just declared infallible, divine and infallible. Look, you've got to see. This is too evident. Rome has made her objective 
too evident to deny. So let's no longer deny it. And let's profess this greatest deception all over the world. That's our spiritual bounden duty. We cannot leave the world ignorant of Satan's devices. We cannot leave the world ignorant of the Antichrist devices that has made the kings of the earth drunk and the people of the earth drunk, unable to reason, unable to walk the straight and narrow, which is Christ. They're all headed down the primrose path to perdition to worship the Pope as the, the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and to cause the Jews likewise to eat and drink animal sacrifices and oblations, thereby damning their souls, just like the Roman Catholics do when they make their oblation every morning, noon, and night. They're going to turn our biblical uh, uh, communion into a literal sacrifice of the body of Christ. The literal sacrifice, just exactly the same sacrifice that took place on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago. That's what they intend for us to do. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church has done always in the Mass. It is a sacrifice. They say it's a sacrifice. They admit it's a sacrifice, and they say you cannot be a Christian unless you make this sacrifice and eat it. And that's what the ecumenical movement is all about. That's what Vatican Council II is all about, to cause you to eat and drink damnation to yourself. Now, if you obey the papacy and its future is fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, you guarantee the Jews are going to eat and drink damnation to themselves. And if you follow the Roman Catholic Church and its ecumenical movement, you will eat and drink damnation to yourself. Do you see the very footsteps of Satan in everything that I've talked about? How can this be so if the body of Christ were not almost incurably deceived? And what should your role be in this world from now on? What should your role as a Bible-believing Christian be in this world from here on out? Do you need any more proof that Daniel's prophecy was perfectly and completely fulfilled by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago? And all you got to do is read the New Testament again and find more evidence that we skipped over or missed because all the proof you would ever need is right there in the New Testament. It was written for the very purpose of proving inerably in front of the eyes of the whole world that Daniel's prophecy is perfectly and completely fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Christ Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come. And for you to believe anything else can only be the result of deception. Delusion. The pollution of common sense. And if you're one of the few, the ultra rare few that are seeing through this greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, you are truly blessed. Biblically blessed. You know? We casually tell everybody, be blessed, be blessed. No, you are blessed with a heavenly blessing, a palpable, visible, heavenly blessing to be undeceived from the futurist deception, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you very much, Tom. I never say be blessed. I always say may God bless you because I cannot bless anyone. Only God can bless people. So I beg and pray for God to bless you. Now, Tom made an interesting point when he said, now that you know all this truth, what are you going to do about it? And what a quote-unquote coincidence, because coincidences don't exist, 
that a few minutes from now, after the ending of this program, I will premiere a video that is called Shout It From The Rooftops. That's what you should do now that you know the truth. Shout it from the rooftops and make sure that everybody hears you. And of course you will be persecuted for that. But so what? You have the liberty with which Christ made you free. You have nothing to lose, but you have everything to gain. Let me tell you, today you gotta listen in historicism. And what is historicism? In historicism, prophecy and history shake hands. See you next time. May God bless you. Maranatha. been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sins. Thou hast taken away all thy wrong Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people Thou hast come
For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely. Grant us thy salvation.